work 60 feet underwater. The biologists can spend up to nine hours on research dives, nine times longer than if they dove from the surface. To recharge their air tanks, they return to the station rather than above the waves. With telephones, microwaves, and computers, Aquarius has all the comforts of home, apart from one very basic facility. Bad smells and things are something you don't want in Aquarius, so um, any kind of bathroom activities are done outside. And so we swim over to one of these little gazebos, and you stand up in that so where you can breathe. And this is kind of a you know marine outhouse. You just have to lower your wetsuit and let nature take its course. But unfortunately, all this activity often alerts the local wildlife. The fish are not uh, overly patient, and they can invade your personal space um, aggressively sometimes. And uh, that's not always comforting. Aquarius is an extraordinary resource for scientists. Living side by side with the coral and animals gives scientists a rare opportunity to learn more about these rainforests of the sea. I, I always see new things when I'm in Aquarius. And part of the reason is you can go out all day. You can go out in the late afternoon and you can come back in at night and you can stay out that whole time. You see all sorts of behaviors that you would miss otherwise. You see interactions among species that you, that you wouldn't normally see. Having that constant access is something that's very unusual and, and very powerful for us as scientists to get access to. Aquarius offers biologists unparalleled access to the coral reef. Who knows what treasures lie waiting to be discovered? But our final destination lies far below the paradise of the coral reefs. 99% of our journey lies deeper than Aquarius. The waters darken with every passing foot. The pressure rises and the temperature falls. It's time to go deeper. Science is presented by Acura. Just a few hundred feet into our dive of almost seven miles, and the environment changes dramatically. Less and less sunlight penetrates down to these depths, and the ocean begins to change color. You begin to lose the blue, uh, blue green, and then finally you get into shades of gray, and then the abyssal blackness. 350 feet down, the Trieste runs straight into an invisible barrier. The water temperature drops from 70 to 50 degrees in the space of a few hundred feet. Most of the sun's heat is absorbed by the upper ocean. Here, water is less dense, but deeper down, less sunlight means cooler, saltier, and denser water. The ocean separates out into layers, warmer water above, denser, colder water below. The barrier between these two layers is called a thermocline. Remember, the bathyscaphe is just a balloon. So we were descending through that warmer upper layer, but when we hit that thermocline, then uh, we weren't heavy enough to go through it, into it. We just bounced like a ball. The Trieste is too buoyant to sink through the layer of dense cold water. It's stuck. To break through, they jettison lightweight gasoline. Now less buoyant, the Trieste penetrates the barrier and sinks on toward the Mariana Trench. We now reach 650 feet down, deeper than the Washington Monument is tall. We are entering a twilight world called the Mesopelagic Zone. 
Barely 1% of sunlight reaches these frigid waters. The temperature plummets to below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But even here, there are mineral riches to be found. Locked beneath the seabed lie vast reserves of oil and gas. To tap these precious resources, some advanced divers venture down over 1,000 feet. But the pressure at these depths is so intense that it's a dangerous and specialized task. We need a technological breakthrough to overcome the limitations of conventional diving methods. A breakthrough that inventor Phil Newton hopes to make. Years of commercial diving have taught Newton long-term exposure to the enormous pressures of the deep ocean can wreck the human body. If you work in the ocean, you come to respect that it's so inexorable, it's so powerful, and we're, we're just fragile little things. We're like a, a, a you know, jellyfish full of chopsticks. We just really are very weak, and the slightest thing just blows us away. Divers in their 20s can develop bones as brittle as 80-year-olds with osteoporosis. So Newton is developing protective mechanical suits that make venturing below 1,000 feet safer and easier. So to go there, you need, do need the armor of technology. And the better the armor you have, the better your chances of survival. The Newt suit is like a submarine you can wear. A rigid aluminum shell protects the diver and maintains atmospheric pressure inside the suit. The latest model is the exosuit. It features a wide-angle viewing dome and can carry enough air for a 48-hour dive. It's built of metal a quarter of an inch thick, strong enough to withstand intense pressure. Neat engineering means it's also flexible. When this narrow part of this wedge is down here, like that, and then all of a sudden the arm is bent. Just because of these two wedges being together. And again, when they're apart, the arm is straight. And so that's how you get this, uh, this sort of flexion extension out of rotation. 20 of these articulated joints give the diver almost complete freedom of movement. Once in position, the divers need to be able to work. And to do that, they need hands. So Newton has created robotic hands that have opposable, indexable thumbs. This is indexable. This thumb, that movement in the thumb is absolutely critical and only some primates have it. All other animals do not. And that allows us to use these fingers to index this, this, and this. His mechanical hand does the same. He can grip, hold, and maneuver objects with incredible dexterity. You can pick up a pencil with this, sign your name, it'll be in your handwriting. You can pick up a ball, throw it against the wall, catch it again, etc. And that's because of this indexable thumb and this ability to reach around in this fashion. In addition to suits, Newton has designed a range of submersibles, but they only work down to 3,000 feet. Beyond that, the intense pressure is too great for them to operate safely. At 3,000 feet, we have around 90% of our journey still ahead of us. Below lies a world starved of sun, ocean mountains a volatile wilderness where the planet creates some of its rocky skin. And life seems to defy the laws of science itself. The first few hundred feet of the world's oceans are bathed in sunlight, rich in plant and animal life. But as we dive deeper, we enter unfamiliar territory. 
home to strange life forms. 10,000 feet down, we arrive at the Abyssal Plains. They cover almost half of the ocean floor, and for the most part, they are featureless. But rising up from the plains is an enormous geological wonder. A feature so extraordinary, it challenges our perception of the oceans, geology, and even life itself. The Mid-Ocean Ridge. An immense chain of mountains stretching around the planet for 40,000 miles like the seam on a baseball. It's the largest